Good morning, it's Dr. Matthew Dunn, host of The Future of Email Marketing. My guest this morning is James Hipkin, um, CEO of Red 8 Interactive and founder of Innately. I want to ask you about Innately. We didn't chat about that in our little preliminary conversation, but, uh, but welcome, James. I'm happy to be here. I, I truly am. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. Tell, tell us a bit about your firms, your companies. Well, Red 8 Interactive is a digital uh, production studio. Mm -hmm. We work with design agencies, primarily in New York, LA, and San Francisco, uh, building large corporate websites. Okay. Um, brands that you would recognize. Um, typically, budgets are in low six figures kind uh -huh. of thing, which is a kind of a roundabout way of saying we actually know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> I love it. That's and what awesome. We, what we found is when we were talking to small business owners, most of them couldn't afford to work with us. Yeah, yeah. But the reality is most of them should have been working with us hmm. because they've been sold all kinds of stuff they don't need. They've paid too much for things. They don't have a proper strategy behind how the website was built, et cetera. So a few years ago, we started using developer downtime to create software that, that allows us to compete with the subscription service website companies. Give like 60%, well, 60% of our customers come to us from either Squarespace or Wix. And and because what do you end up doing for them different and be differently and better? Well, it's not, differently we're using different technology, but it really isn't okay. about the technology. Sure. Hopefully you'll smile when I say this. We answer the phone. <laughs> That's my philosophy too, man. <laughs> yeah. What these small business owners, they don't want to be handed the keys to a Ferrari and wish the best of luck. Mm, yeah. We do it for them. Yeah. Okay. We wrote our software with another opportunity in mind. Um, stay at home moms. They haven't become less smart because they've decided to stay at home and raise children. Right. They'd love to have a part-time job, but their current choices are retail where they're being paid minimum wage and living at the whim of a retail staffing algorithm. Yeah. So we offer them much better than minimum wage. They can control their own hours. They're doing interesting work and we train them how to build websites for small business owners. So, so that, that, that set of uh, people resources um, are, are doing the technical work with the platform that you and your developers created. That's correct. And we wrote the software with that audience in mind okay. so that they can literally take a website from beginning to end without involving a developer and do an amazing job. And it's very satisfying work. Our customers are thrilled because they actually get to work with someone and they don't have to fight with it themselves. Yes. Um, and we have the depth of resource that if something does go awry or they need something special, yeah, we have the tools and and staff that can actually do it. Now, well, uh, we well, look after the hosting, we look after the security, we look after the maintenance of software, all that stuff that, all that stuff is vitally important. Not particularly difficult for us because it's what we do. Yeah. But it's not something the average small business owner <laughs> wants to have to fight with. Yeah, that's for sure. Or 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 even, you know, even knows where to punch, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, exactly. A, it's, a, it's too, too technical a job. Is that, uh, we'll get strategic in a minute, but just to geek out for a second, is is the, the platform work you do on on top of something else? Are you, are you talking database on up, WordPress on up, what? Uh, we use WordPress as an operating system, and mm -hmm. we've written software that sits on top of WordPress. Yeah, okay. That allows the, it's basically a full, getting geeky for just a second, it's a full theme editing suite. Okay. So yeah. that so that the it's pay, it's a page builder, but it's much more than a page builder because the the content specialists can deal with the headers and the footers and and logos and all. It's a full a full theme editing suite, right? Um, and that gives them an awful lot of power. And it's also because we build these large corporate sites, we've come to realize that. 80% of layouts can be done with 20% of things. <laughs> and we focused our software on the 20% of things that really matter as opposed to 
other page builders that exist, which tend to be very heavy and very bloated because the developers get very excited about doing everything you could possibly imagine and a whole bunch of things you never would imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so our sites are very light and yeah. they perform very, very well. Yeah. Because the, the reality is talking about customers for just a second, you have less than six seconds, which is a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To to catch a visitor's attention, mm -hmm. and you don't want to be wasting three of those six seconds waiting for the page waiting to load. For the page to load. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How? Uh, what a world we! What a world we've created, huh? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tickled pink to talk with someone in the web space because maybe it's the gray hair at the temples. But uh, I still find myself oriented towards web and email and what I think of as the, you know, the, 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 the core internet technologies, the core digital platforms. I find Facebook at all irksome, stupid, misused, and a bunch of other things. <laughs> and yet that's where most small businesses end up pouring their precious resources is uh, down rabbit holes with advertising that yields them diddly. Well, it, it can be very effective if it if it's done within the context of a strategy. Yeah. If it's just done as an individual thing, gosh, I'm my my son in law told me I needed to do Facebook advertising, so yeah. I'm out there spending money on Facebook, but it's got no context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's when you take any of the digital marketing tactics and tie them together. I call it the hub and spoke strategy. Yeah. Where the website becomes the hub everything's rotating into and out of the website. So all of your digital marketing tactics, Facebook advertising, search engine optimization, Google AdWords, email marketing, are pulling people into it and taking the information from the website to color the content you're sending out. So it's a back and forth exercise. And then the rim is the content and messaging strategy. Okay. And when you tie those three things together, you get the wheel, one of the world's most fundamental and principal inventions. <laughs> yeah. And there's an awful lot of power individually. When I used to do public speaking pre-pandemic, I'd stand in, a, in front of an audience and I'd have a bicycle hub in one hand and a handful of spokes in the other hand, and there'd be a rim sitting on the lectern. And I'd say, you know, these pieces are nice, but individually they don't have much value. Hmm when you put them together, you have a lot of power because the power comes from the connection. So Facebook advertising can be very effective if sure. you've got the pixel installed on the website and you're actually tracking the information. Facebook wants you to be successful. Hmm. And you use that pixel to understand what your target audience looks like because you're attracting them back into the website via mm -hmm. organic social media or paid social media or email marketing or whatever the tactics are. And you're taking your, I call it feeding the pixel. You're, you're training that pixel, <laughs> what your audience looks like. Yeah. But because you have a hub and spoke strategy, you know what to say, you know what to say at each level of interaction that the, the consumer is displaying with you. It's not a black and white thing. Every customer goes through a journey. Most customers, I'm going to get to email marketing in just a second, honest to God. No, that's okay. You're giving a context, which I love. Yeah. Most customers spend most of their time out on the edges of the bell curve where they have you know, close to zero interest in what you're selling and doing. Mm -hmm. They just don't have a need at this moment. Mm-hmm. When they do start to have a need, then their interest, I call it the interest curve, it looks like a bell curve, their interest starts to climb that left-hand slope. They're still, you know, trying to figure out what, whether or not you, what you've got solves their problem. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out whether you're trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And all of those things can be accomplished through microtransactions that you're setting up using the hub and spoke strategy with combination of messaging media and the website to deliver the right amount of information at the right time. So you've got these micro transactions and each time a consumer executes a micro transaction, it builds the relationship. It builds the trust. 
Now, those microtransactions can be as simple as watching a video on Facebook. Yeah. Spending more than five seconds on it. A microtransaction might be actually liking a post, whether it's an organic post or a paid post. Mm -hmm. A microtransaction might be sharing that post. And you'll notice each of these microtransactions I'm describing are a richer interaction. Yeah. Yeah. They might be going to the website and reading a post. They might right. be going to the website, reading a post, and then giving over their email address to join the mailing list. Right, right. And each of these transactions builds that trust, it builds that relationship so that when they get to the to the final sale, which is not the end of the journey, by the way, it's right. just the middle. The Truthfully, people talk about marketing funnels and they really should be talking about marketing hourglasses. I said that about five years ago, and I couldn't agree more. Like, that's terrific. <laughs> I've got a diagram somewhere on the hard disk here of an hourglass. Yeah. I'm like, what's with the funnel? It's the wrong shape. It's it's limiting your well, thinking. <laughs> it's the right shape. It's only half of what you're It's doing. only half, yes. <laughs> because once once they've made, because the most important purchase is not the first purchase. No. It's the second purchase. Yeah. Yeah. Or in the case and of a restaurant, is, the third, right? Third visit, and you'll become a regular. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Vanderchuk talks about that, I believe. I remember hearing him talk about that. Um, and, and it's true. Yeah. And this is where email marketing can become a very powerful tool for a business because you've got that opportunity where if you harp going back to the interest curve again, mm -hmm. most of your customers are out there on the edges. And that's where regular, I call it the lazy river, regular email communication with your customers, creating value, sharing information. You're not selling anything. Mm -hmm. Don't try to sell. Right. Create value, create relationship. Give them the opportunity to engage with you to create those microtransactions. Your goal is to build a relationship that goes beyond the functional transactional equities that are created mm -hmm. and into a more of a, a, a relationship type thing. So your lazy river can accomplish that. And you spend most of your time on the subject line and the preview text. Because even if that's all they see, they, it reminds you of their positive experience. Right. And right. It, it, when they're ready, they'll yeah. dive in because they know it's not going to be a whole lot of, you know, shilling. Yeah. They're going to get some value out of this. Yeah. And, you know, these Lazy River emails can have really nice open rates and really interesting interactions if they're done properly. You know, avoid the wall of words. <laughs> to create emails that look like blog posts. There's lots of single sentences, lots of white space. Intersperse them with, you know, appropriate images. You know, don't make them works of art. Make them useful. Hmm. Hmm. So and then. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. This is good. Well, and, and then you've got all kinds of opportunities when they interact with you, then you can track that and have automations in place that will tr be triggered when they interact. If they mm -hmm. click on a link that goes to a, a, a blog post about golfing, mm -hmm. send them another email that talks about golfing in more detail. Right. Give them the opportunity to demonstrate that they're climbing the interest curve, that they're engaging with you. Right. And there's not a better medium than email marketing for that kind of a customer communication. Yeah, no, I, 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 I mean, I tend to agree for obvious reasons, but in, in the interest of, hopefully there's someone in the, you know, someone in the listening audience who says, oh, baloney, uh, why do you think so? And I'll talk about why I think so. Why email marketing? Well, well, because it's it's low cost. Um, it's something that people are very comfortable with. They're not having they're in their email every day. Mm -hmm. um, they they're looking for you to see if you're interested. One of the relationship marketing principles that I talk about is good customers expect to be rewarded. Um, we're getting into some of the weeds here, but another thing that should be considered is segmentation so that your list, not all customers are created equal. 
Right. You've got 20% of your customers who are generating probably 80% of your sales. Right. Right. Well, know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're heavy category users. They have a strong need for your product, which is mm -hmm. why they're such good customers, mm -hmm. but it also means they're very knowledgeable. Right. Don't craft the same messaging to them that you would craft to the great unwashed. Right. <laughs> and if you do that, then you've got, you're creating value. You're, you're showing them, first of all, you're rewarding them for being great customers because you're yeah. giving them all this extra content and extra value. Yeah. And you're acknowledging that they have, you know, are smart about the product. Interesting. Yeah. Gotcha. The other thing I would add about email as a, as a, as a channel, because I agree with everything that you said there is, is that, it's it's the it's the digital channel where locus of control for attention stays with the guy on the other end, with the recipient, with the customer. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a number of guests um, and some interesting conversations about uh, the interplay between uh, messaging and texting and email. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, anyone selling texting will talk about the fact that you know you're going to get ninety nine percent blah, 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 rates. And it's true. Mm -hmm. But if you text me, I'm going to look right now. Yep. That's a locus of control, meaning you just interrupted me. Where That's email, right. we're all perfectly comfortable. Your word, comfortable. Like we're comfortable with, hey, I'll get to that later, right? When I want yep. to, when I'm interested, when when I'm looking for a solution to that problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, from that perspective, it's, it's got a degree of sort of re respect for the respect for the other person's attention and control that's hard to find <laughs> in most right. digital channels and in, in social media channels, um, you don't actually get to say whether or not the message is going to reach them. So that, so right. th those filters are a whole different ball game, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly right. And, and that sense of control. One of the things I talk to folks about a lot is the difference between inside out copy and outside in copy. Okay. Expand on inside that. Inside out copy. And this is a mistake that I see made often on websites in email marketing. They talk about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. They talk about all their things that they can do that are amazing. And from a consumer perspective, it's, I have a problem. How are you going to solve it? Yeah. Right. I don't care about all that stuff. <laughs> I have this problem and how am I going to solve it? Mm -hmm. And if you write your copy, whether it's the website copy or the email copy, taking that consumer perspective, mm -hmm. you're creating value. You're showing them that I understand what your problems are mm -hmm. and we're here to help. And here's why you can believe what we're saying as opposed to, you know, we're awesome. We're awesome. Here's a whole list of features and attributes. You figure out which ones work for you. Right. Right. Yeah. Go down the small, small business, uh, track for a moment. This just struck me many times, both the, both as, you know, as, as someone who works with small businesses, knows a lot of people who owns them and, and, you know, uh, run small businesses in a sense myself, there's a, there's a lot of overhead to this digital stuff. Yep. It's like it it's, really is. it's resource expensive and intensive. We we thought it we thought it was going to make life easier and better, but you know, in in our conversation thus far, you've been describing a fair amount of work that's not the actual service. If I, if I'm a you know if I'm a bike shop, local mm -hmm. bike shop in town, you know, I think my shtick is selling bikes servicing bikes helping people use their bikes but right you know writing about bikes and models and hubs and spokes and all that kind of stuff wh where was that in the business plan i didn't realize i was a i was a flipping publisher right and and but they are mm -hmm. and and it is it, and this is where one of the other things i talk about within the hub and spoke strategy don't try to boil the damned ocean <laughs> Right. Pick one or two things and do them really well. Niche. Create value. Don't try to be all things to all people. Cause first of all, you can't. Mm -hmm. 
Second of all, it's very expensive and not just monetarily expensive. You touched on it a second ago when you referenced resource allocation. You know, for most small business owners, time is their most valuable commodity. Yeah. Yeah. Much more valuable than cash, you know, in many situations. Yeah. Um, and you want to pick the channels that are going to generate the most effect for you. And talking to your current customers, I mean, there's five ways customers contribute to your revenue. The longer they stay with you, the more return you have on the initial investment required. Mm -hmm. They're much more likely to buy more products and services from you. Mm -hmm. Because they understand your value proposition, they're much more likely to full pay full price. You don't have to bribe them to come back. They're less expensive to service because they know how your product and service, they know where you live, you, right. they know where you work. I mean, they, they know the address, et cetera. And finally, they're much more likely to re refer other customers to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, so become, think part, about it. they become part of your marketing, right? They become part of your marketing. So that, that's five different ways these customers, I, I mean, I'm pulling from my past in the corporate world, um, I had Visa as a client for a long time. And, and I was very involved in, in this kind of customer work with Visa. Mm -hmm. And they did, they had the data. I'll bet. You know, a 10% a <laughs> in, increase in customer loyalty would generate a 100% increase in revenue. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, I did a program with uh, back in the day, Back in the when, during the long distance wars in the '90s, um, I had a customer uh, sprint, and I worked with the chief marketing officer, and they were spending 150 million dollars a year on advertising back in the 1990s. Wow, it's a lot of money! It's a lot of money, and they were not moving their market share. So we started. They were competing Understood. with MCI at the time, right? MCI and AT&T, AT the long distance yeah, yeah. services. Yeah, yeah, AT&T yeah. was sending out checks and MCI had their friends and family program. Yep. So we I sat down with the chief marketing officer and we developed an idea around this customer idea, this five ways customers. We found the 20% of their customers who were the most valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And we built programs. It wasn't email marketing at the time. It was direct mail. Yeah. Um, but we built programs with them where we had streams of communication that did what I was just describing. They didn't try to sell anything. They created value by describing to the customers how they could better utilize the services they already had. Hmm. Hmm. In a three in a three million piece direct mail package, we'd have a up to up to an over a million different versions because we were customizing the. Um, the messaging in these direct mail packages to suit what the customer actually had and how they used their product. Okay. We were getting open open rates in the 60% range Wow. on direct wow. mail. Yeah, on direct mail. Wow. wow. And then we also took their interactions and, and the way they used them, we used that to streamline sales messaging. So we reduced our costs on the sales side because we were sending fewer pieces. Mm-hmm. We were getting conversion rates in the high teens on direct mail on wow. these sales messaging yeah. because we'd earned the right to talk to them and we were sending the right message to the right person. Yeah. It, it, so over <laughs> over <laughs> five years yeah. doing that program, first yeah. took about a year to get it all up and running. Yeah. The second, the next four years, we were generating a 20% revenue growth on a two billion dollar base of business wow. year over year wow. and they never moved market share wow wow how how did you help how did you help a customer in this case sprint <clears throat> think beyond you know nominal and transactional to that broader uh value view of the long-term relationship with a customer because I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a bunch more long distance calls, if if you if I'm already a let's say a Sprint customer, right? Like, 
I'm only gonna I'm only gonna have so many conversations for so many hours back when we paid for a long distance, right? right? Because the right. objective wasn't to get me to spend more time on the phone long distance. There's a lot there's a lot subtler objective there. The objective was to get them to not churn. Yeah. Because we were targeting the best customers. We were targeting the 20% that, mm -hmm. that represented 80% of the revenue. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. gotcha. And the longer we could keep them, yep. the more ROI we were getting. Yeah. Yeah. That makes the sense. Big, the better the relationship we had with them, mm -hmm. the more likely they were to I'll get my paging from Sprint too. Right. Add services. I'll get my internet from Sprint too. Yeah. You yeah. know? It was back DSL back then, if you could remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can see, and this is how we were generating those kinds of revenue growth, that kind of revenue growth yeah. from that customer base because of the five ways customers can contribute. And they were spending less time on customer care calls because they knew how to use the service. Right, right. You know, they were they were telling their friends and about that what a great, relationship they have we're gonna need a we're, we're gonna need to put a glossary and hyperlinks with this particular podcast episode because between the two of us we've been making historical references that i'm not sure everybody is gonna get that's true long that's distance true. huh dsl Whoa, what <laughs> <laughs> well you know i i remember i started at a new york ad agency called ted bates mm-hmm and this was during the time when the Apple Lisa was launched and the IBM PC was launched. Giddy up, yeah. And we we were considered advanced because we had a word processing team in a, off in a room. <laughs> that was with, that was where we were. With so a, I, I went out and I, I I leased an IBM PC of my own yeah. dime. Yeah, yeah. We had to do these budget control reports, and they yeah. required a spreadsheet, and we were yeah. doing it all by hand, and we and calculated, and we turn it into the word processing room, and they would make mistakes, make and then we'd pretty, have to edit and yeah, back yeah. and forth. So and you oh fired up VisiCalc or Lotus One Two Three, Lotus One Two Three, <laughs> and I figured out how to use it, and yep. I built the budget, and yep. my boss, actually my boss's boss. At that time, he ended up being CEO of the organization globally. But the, but he he was went raging by my office. We had offices back then, which is very cool. I hear they're coming back into fashion. Yes, <laughs> yeah, was apparently. And he he I could almost hear him skidding in the hall. And he came back. Hepkin, what have you done? What is that thing? I'm not paying for that thing. Who's paying for that thing? Right. right? Right. I had a big giant computer on my desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, wow, and, that's and when Bill stopped awesome. yelling, yeah, I said, "Here, come here. Remember budget control reports, Bill? Oh yeah, oh yeah. They're awful things. Yeah, come here, look at this." And I showed him what I could do, and I should see if I change this number here, everything else changes. Yep, and it's all correct. And it's all correct. And he's like, "Holy crap!" Yeah. That's going to save us so much time. Ding. And money. Within, within six months, every account executive in the agency had a personal computer. Yeah, yeah, had a personal computer. This is probably right around the, this is just before the Charlie Chaplin modern time themes um, uh, ad campaign for the, was it the PC Junior, I think? I don't remember. Yeah. Remember that? I remember that the campaign? ad campaign. Yes. I remember what yes, the product was. I do remember at the time the. And I use this case study often with folks, the, the wonderful example of the power of positioning. The, the Apple Lisa was launched. Mm. And then shortly, about six months later, the IBM PC was launched. Mm -hmm. But the Apple Lisa's marketing was all very fuzzy. It was all focused around, gosh, isn't this amazing technology? It was inside out. Mm. IBM launched the PC, which was inferior technology. Yeah. Yeah, but they arguably. launched it with, we're the personal computer for business. Yeah. 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 And they summarily repositioned Apple as a toy. Yeah. And it took them 20 plus years to recover from that. Wow. Arguably, arguably, they've never recovered in terms of the positioning of the Mac. And you're talking to a hardcore Mac guy. But yeah. an ex Microsoft guy as well, right? Yeah. Where, oh, no, 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 serious. If it's on your desk and you're running your corporation, you're going to have, you know, Windows computers, uh, that's you know, right. descendant of the IBM PC. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're because right. Because they, they, they told the, 
people who could actually afford the computers, that yeah. this was for them. This they had them. the brand cachet to back it up and they repositioned the competition mm. without even mentioning them. Yeah, without it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then all the Macs were hiding out in the creative department for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and poor Linux with no one in charge just doesn't have a snowball's chance of, uh, of landing That's on the right. desks in any significant numbers ever. It's better ever. or not, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. And this is a, another great example of being outside in versus inside out. Outside in, meaning it's, think from the customer's point of view. Yeah, solve the customer's problem. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, and and give them reasons to believe that your solution will in fact will work. Do their thing. I'm curious about something in 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 your businesses plural. You know, innately red eight. Um, it's got to be interesting to have a foot in the world of solving the website problems of a large you know large brand, right. and then. Taking a technology and mechanisms knowledge, and 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 working with small business customers. What do you find the same between them, and what do you find jarringly different? That's a great question. I wish I had a glib answer, but I don't. <laughs> um, they're just very different. Yeah. Um, with small businesses, you're typically dealing with one person. Mm -hmm. And you're typically dealing with the decision maker. Mm -hmm. And if you can have a rational conversation, demonstrate why the solution is going to help their business, mm -hmm. they'll usually sign up. It's not a lot of fuss and bother about the whole thing. When you're dealing with the large corporations, you're dealing with a committee. Mm -hmm. You've got stacks of folks. I can't tell you the number of times I've said to our contact there, okay, has the CEO seen this? Because we don't want to be two days away from launch and the CEO says he wants something changed. Right, right. Right, so I have to encourage them and coach them on communication and getting, you know, lots of people need to see this. We talk to folks about functional requirements <laughs> and I'll, I'll say, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Has anybody talked to, talk to HR? What are their requirements from right. a job perspective, job right. recruitment perspective? Oh, well, that's an interesting idea. We hadn't thought of that. <laughs> we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Has anybody talked to the, you know, how the marketing operations people, the sales team, how yeah. they need yeah. this to work for them? Yeah. Are you using a CRM? Yeah. Well, yes, we are. Would it be a good idea for the <laughs> website to be integrated with the CRM? Seems like oh, a reason. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Good what idea. A, what, what, an, what an interesting idea. <laughs> okay. It, this is, it's mostly about the, the conversations that we're having. When I'm dealing with small business owners, I'm dealing yeah. with the owner of the company. Yeah. And, you know, we can solve problems quickly, easily, and efficiently. <laughs> when I'm dealing with corporations, it's just a whole different language. It's a whole different... Well, it, yeah, you, you, you're not, I mean, you're not talking with one person, which you already said clearly. I mean, in, in earlier, you know, earlier stages of, uh, of our company, we had a, a, a ton of big corporate clients where we were developing explainer videos. We were one of the first studios to start doing that kind of work uh, well over a decade ago. Um, and they drove me nuts mm -hmm. because... It's like the bigger the company, the dumber the end point to be crass about it. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're, they're responsible I'm not go for, there, but I yeah, don't well, they're responsible for, you know, you know, the the whole relationship and success of the project, et cetera, et cetera. But they're this there's this ridiculous invisible army of, of people with a say in it. And right. and the the reasons to do something or not do something aren't necessarily about the project they're about you know politics budgets control climbing ladders and a whole bunch of other stuff like they, honestly they made me a little bit nuts i got more and more draconian about process as we went along because i realized it's a lot more expensive to to be efficient with with big companies than it is with small companies because you can't go rational conversation 
identify the key factors, make a decision, we're done, move, right? It's, it's that's, like that's right. months of pulling teeth. It made me crazy. It really yep. did. And, that, that, and we're, just, we're just dealing, for the most part, we're the construction general contractor. Hmm. Our design agency customers are, are dealing with all of that. We're yeah. just dealing, for the most part, with the folks in the design agency. Okay, okay, and gotcha. since I have an agency background, I know how to speak the language. Yeah. I remember being in a meeting with an agency in San Francisco and I walked out of the meeting and the executive creative director walked out with me and put his arm around my shoulder. And you could do that back then. Um, <laughs> and said, you're, you're quite something. And I said, why am I quite something? He said, we just spent an hour with you talking about websites and you didn't talk about code once. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, that, I assume that you know that we can do that. Yeah. What we're trying to talk about is can we can we represent what you're doing creatively and strategically yeah. in a way that your client is going to just love? Yeah, yeah. And that's a di whole different layer. I mean, the code part, well, yeah, of course we can do that. Yeah, yeah. He said, the... oh, yeah, no, I get it, he said, but... Um, most people don't do that. <laughs> mm, right, right. Well, those of us, uh, those of us in the technical field, and those of us in the creative field, don't always talk well. <laughs> right, Steve right. Jobs, intersection of technology and liberal arts. Uh, yep. You know, background signs like yeah, it's a tough intersection to hang out in. Uh, or, yeah, it or, was or, interesting. I, I actually um, did some work with them. Yeah. Um, I was worked on the team that launched the original. Uh, Apple iPod. Oh, wow. Cool. Cool. With that the wheel, was, right? That, yep. That was a fascinating listening to him talk about what yeah. the real thing was and, you know, keeping people on track with what the, what they were really selling, which wasn't the, the device. Right. It was uh, the iTunes store. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the brilliant innovation. Yep. Yep. The device was just the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, was just a, was the end point, if you will, for that whole, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, fascinating. Um, let's go back to email marketing just for fun, <laughs> sure. for for a second. Um, as a, you said something early on about email marketing sort of being, you know, undervalued, under under underutilized, maybe even under underappreciated. Appreciated? Yeah. Why? Why? Well, because it's old. It's like like it's like those of us with gray hair on our temples. <laughs> If we don't always get valued, <laughs> um, but it, it's an oldie, but a goodie. And hmm. um, it is something when, when you're dealing with customers, they're being overwhelmed with things and all kinds of shiny new things, TikTok right. and, and Instagram and, and, you know, Facebook is now old, but <laughs> you've got to get past a bunch of barriers with email marketing, you don't have to get past those barriers. This is something they've been doing their entire adult life. So you can get immediately to your messaging, which is why the subject line and the preview text are so important. Mm -hmm. Because you're not, they're, they're willing to embrace the medium. They yeah. embrace it yeah. multiple times every day. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're not, you don't have to climb that hill. Right. You don't have to introduce a habit. Right. And you're not interrupting anything. You made this point really well earlier in our conversation. You're not interrupting anything. They're choosing to look at their email. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you make that choice worth their while, mm -hmm. they will engage with your, mm -hmm. with you via that email. There's, there's no other medium out there that, that can do that as efficiently because it's also not, it, it does take time so it has some resource expense there's no question but it's also um you know automation can be really effectively used yeah um i mean we've built automation programs for email automation programs for the island of bermuda earlier in my career they were just sending everybody the same stuff all the time sure and when we started segmenting the audience and we started using automations to actually respond when people interacted with a link mm -hmm. 
the results were spectacular. Yeah. And it wasn't that difficult to do. Right, right. Um, it just required some strategy as opposed to just, well, I'm going to be sending emails out to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the age is, the age of the channel, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it maybe had cachet <laughs> pre-Grey Temples for some of us, but, you know, it's like it's been part of the landscape for long enough where there's, there's, there's nothing to it. And critically, there's, there's nobody pushing it. Right. right. No one, no one sold you email. Like right. you, you kind of had to, or you did, or of course you need to. So at, at some point you got on the on ramp, but no one ever called and gave you a big pitch about buying their email client or, or right. get it, getting, getting emails. Like we all just sort of absorbed it. And, and so right. there's no, there's no champion to, to keep the channel visible either. Arguably, Arguably, Google and Gmail do something of that job, um, but but with a very different motive. <laughs> yeah, Gmail is more focused around transactional emails um, as opposed to marketing. Did you see that Intuit recently bought Mailchimp? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, twelve billion dollar bought. Yeah, that's a, a that's a, a someone thinks email is still valuable. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, um, I frankly am terrified. Um, How come being being a QuickBooks customer, hmm. uh, Intuit hasn't met a user interface that they can't mess up. Yeah, and Mailchimp's yeah. biggest. We recommend Mailchimp to all of our small business customers. We because, have an agency li- because it's so easy to work with. Because it's so easy to work with. Yeah, 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 yeah. and and relatively inexpensive. There are others that are cheaper. Um, and if somebody's a really advanced. Um, user, then we may migrate them up to something like Active Campaign or one mm-hmm. of the more mm-hmm. mid-level ESPs. But yeah. um, email marketing is an underappreciated and underutilized. With a little bit of effort, not mm-hmm. a lot, but with a little bit of effort, you can increase the impact of email marketing. I mean, huge. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, means I- increase increase your business. Right. I mean, it, right. not just the impacts, like the long term, long term return on it. <clears throat> and the other thing, <clears throat> it's worth saying again, even if one of us has already said it, you know, within the last 45 minutes, you own that. You own that connection. That's correct. Someone else Not doesn't own that land. connection. That's a big, big, big deal. And one of the reasons why I put the website is the hub and the hub and spoke strategy. Yep. Is because you own that. Yep. Real Agreed. estate. Yep, agreed. You you're not renting domain. space on the Facebook platform. You're yep. not renting space. This is and the, you own your customers. Yeah, yeah. Use and email marketing is a fantastic medium to use to communicate with those valuable customers. With those valuable customers. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do your segmentation. Recognize that there are a lot of folks that just don't need you that often. So do your segmentation, understand who your best customers are and get the right message out there to the right people at the right time and do it consistently. The lazy river is a powerful thing. You know, it's interesting. I'm sure someone has done this, but despite the age of the two channels we've been talking about most, web, email, for a lot of historical and technical reasons, they have evolved to be typically separate offerings in the marketplace, mm-hmm. right? You've got, you know, Squarespace, Wix, uh, you know, innately, and Mailchimp, Active Campaign, etc. Um, I'm sure there are decent, you know, website plus. Uh, you know, email offerings out there. I'm hard pressed to name one. Right. So that 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 connecting job of of like really your segmentation should be in part powered by the pixel, powered by the website, right. powered by the transactions. But oy vey, good luck trying to find a system that does that for you. Well, they, but they do a reasonably good job. I mean, we have a lot of e-commerce sites that we've 
built and manage and yeah. and and Mailchimp for example does a really good job of integrating with WooCommerce mm-hmm. and and can set up those triggers mm-hmm. very efficiently and very effectively and mm-hmm. relatively easily but once Absolutely. again our point of differentiation is that we don't ask the small business owner to figure this out for themselves <laughs> we don't hand them right. the keys to the Ferrari and yeah. don't crash yeah 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 yeah. We have folks who know how to do this. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And if you've I've done armed, it a few times, it's and, easier. And if, so, and, and from an investment point of view, would you rather, as a small business owner, spend your valuable time, because that's the most valuable thing, figuring all this stuff out, or pay one of my content specialists to do it? Right, right. Yeah, no, it, makes, it makes sense. It makes sense. It's, too, uh, it's still too detailed to you know, too technical, too much specialized knowledge required to just expect to pick it up and figure it out yourself. Right. And, yeah. and sure you can, These you can smart people, Yeah, but you're never going to do it as well as somebody who does it all the time. Yeah. yeah. You're never going to do it as fast as somebody who does it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You're and never going to be able to see the, the additional layers of opportunity compared to somebody who does it all the time. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Well, listen to us, man, wandering far in a field. What a delightful conversation. It's, it's been a, it's been wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> where does, uh, where does some, if someone's listening to this and they're like, oh man, I need that kind of help. Where does, where does the small business guy hunt you down and where does the agency who might work with Red 8 hunt you down? Well, um, let me talk to that. I, I really like folks to embrace the hub and spoke marketing strategy and see mm-hmm. for themselves the power of this connection. Mm-hmm. So we've created a URL hub and spoke dot marketing, where you can download our ebook journey cool. to success, digital marketing for small business owners. Nice. Let me repeat that hub and spoke dot marketing. So see how John connects the rim, which is his content with the spokes. Email marketing is what we've talked about most today, but all the digital media channels and the website and just the power that comes from that. That would be the, a great starting point for folks to, to reach out. Perfect. And, hub and spoke you know, dot marketing. Hub, hub and spoke dot marketing. And they'll, and it's a wonderful little ebook. Um, you know, my liberal arts degree, I can actually, you know, put a word or two together. Um, <laughs> and uh, do you remember the book called the goal years ago? Yeah, vaguely. It's good. It's good. I, I've yeah. re- reread it several times. It's still very germane to today. But he did a wonderful job of turning all this technical information into a story. And that's what we tried to do with this ebook. Nice. Is this, It's not a treatise on, on digital marketing. It's a story about a small business owner named John. Nice. Hub nice. and spoke dot marketing. Hub and spoke dot marketing. We'll, we'll send people there. My uh, my guest today has been James Hipkin, the CEO of Red 8 Interactive and Innately, and sounds like one of the driving creative forces behind hubandspoke.marketing. Thank you very much. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Thanks.